Hello, welcome to the stream. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Trent. And if you could just say in the chat, if you're here, if you can actually hear my voice, I can see some of you have commented already. Thanks for joining me today. MTM, Amy, Sekhmet Tara, good to have you guys back. Oliver, great to have you from Germany again. So I did my last stream about two weeks ago, my last regularly scheduled stream. It was about two weeks ago on Sunday. And then, of course, we got some interesting news in the following days that Canva bought Affinity. So I did kind of a, a little emergency stream to kind of get people's feedback and stuff like that. So that was the last time I did, uh, did this stream. I haven't really seen any new news since then. We had that initial announcement, and then we got like the pledge the next day from Affinity saying they kind of made some main points that they were going to pledge to keep the, the one-time payment. That was always going to be an option on the side. We don't know if there will be some subscription act, uh, side to it, but they said that that will always be a one-time payment option. Uh, yeah, I got a haircut. Every once in a while, it happens. <laughs> and um, and we also they also said like they were going to commit to the features and things like that going forward. So yeah, I don't really know of any new news since then. It's kind of been just quiet for two weeks in terms of that. So yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. Hello, Nick. Hello, Bill. Hello, Martin. Thanks for joining us. So I see one person from Florida, one person from the East Coast of the US, but lots of European representation today. That's great. So I thought today we'd talk about a couple topics related to masking. And then later I'd go over your Q&A, just some stuff I've uh, gathered over the, the weeks from your comments and things like that. But this concept of masking, I think is kind of interesting because, you know, it's there's kind of like the basic masking and then there's some of the more advanced concepts that can make life actually a little bit easier if you understand them. Hi, IH. Hi, Bob. So I thought we'd first start with the luminosity range masks. And to be clear, a lot of this is going to just relate to Affinity Photo today. Uh, these features aren't exactly in Affinity uh, Designer yet. They're, they're kind of raster-based operations, and I guess they could be in the Pixel Persona, but they're not. They're just in the Affinity Photo. So... Yeah, let's start with luminosity range masks. So let me open up for Finny Photo here. Now, just in case we need a little review of how masking works, let me just kind of go over the basics here. So I just created this gradient, and you'll see why I created a gradient in a little bit. It'll help demonstrate this concept a little bit. But the basic way we can create a mask is we can just click this button down here. So I say mask layer. So I'll click that. And we have a mask under our gradient. Hi, Bob. Howdy. So the way masks work is that black will, it's almost like going to erase our layer and white will reveal it. So white is, a, is our entire mask right now. If I alt click on it, you can see this is my entire mask. So it's allowing my whole image to be shown. The interesting thing of course, is usually what happens when we add black to it. So I'll use just any paintbrush here. What brush am I using? I'll just use a solid one. And I'll select my color as black. So I have black here. And if I start painting on my, on my uh, mask, I can actually see through my, my layer here. And in case it wasn't obvious, the layer below it is this blue here. I made it blue just because when it's white, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to see what's happening. So blue is a little easier to see the transparency. And if I choose white to paint back on my mask, I can actually bring it back. So kind of the key idea here is that this is a non-destructive technique, and that's what we like to do whenever possible. You know, I could do the eraser on my on my layer here. So if I had like the eraser here, I could erase, of course, that's an option, but this is going to permanently destroy my, my pixel layer here. So I won't do that. I'll just paint here on my mask. And by the way, levels of gray are going to be kind of semi-transparent. So if I do different levels of gray here. So this is what my mask looks like. And this is the effect it's having. having. So kind of just a basic little review there. So let me delete that. So the question we, we may have is, well, how do we, can we mask on other criteria, like smarter criteria than just us painting in something? And then it says, yeah, there's a bunch of different options we can do. And the first one we'll look at is called a luminosity mask. So as you may expect, it's going to mask based on luminosity. Now, if you right click on this mask layer down here, 
you actually have a bunch of different types of options here. And we'll go over some of these today. We'll go over the compound, hue range, and luminosity range. I actually made, I have videos filmed on these. I need to edit them and I'll be publishing them soon. Bandpass mask, I'll also make a video on. I just have to find some good ideas for demos on that one. So let's do the luminosity range mask. So again, I right clicked on the mask layer and I said luminosity range mask. Now this concept might be kind of familiar if you did the blend options, if you know how those work. But if not, I'll just I'll explain this concept from scratch. So we have this graph here. And sometimes when we're using this program or any programs, these graphs can be kind of intimidating. But there's really only a couple different ways that to read them. And usually once you kind of know one, you know all of them. And this is one where left to right is going to be the dark to bright in our image. So if you ever use curves, that's the same thing. If you've ever seen levels, it's the same idea. The left side represents the, the dark pixels, and we kind of gradually go over to the right to the, to the lighter pixels. What's different is usually what, what up and down means, so what the top to the bottom means. And in this case, that's going to be our level of opacity. So in other words, the bottom is completely transparent and the top is completely solid. So right now you see kind of the, the default case, which is nothing is happening because I have my line up here. Let me drag this line down. And now you can see my whole image is transparent. All the blacks, all the grays, all, all the whites are going to be transparent there. If I go to the 50% mark, I'm at 50% opacity. So that's, you know, it's a little bit off here. I'm a little slanted, but pretend it's 50%. So this is gonna be 50% opacity on my, on my image, left to right. So hopefully it's making sense so far. So moving this straight line up and down is just basically the same as changing the opacity here. It's gonna be similar to that. Now the interesting question is what happens when this line is bent? So if I take this line and I bend it in some crazy way, what is this doing? So let me, let me uh, give you a better example of that. So I'll, I'm not click linear just so this line is straight. Cause if you, so if you do linear, it'll make the line straight. It'll make the corners straight. So one thing you can do here, I'm just going to do this as an example is let's say I want the bottom 25% of colors or values to be transparent. Well, I can make this graph like this. And if you can see what's happening is the darkest part of my image down here is fully transparent because what this graph is saying is for the, for the black parts on this left side, that's the darkest 25%, bring the opacity down to 0%, okay? So I've suppressed all this black down here. Just a rem reminder of what it originally looked like. This is the darker part. So when I have this luminosity range mask on, I'm actually saying make this bottom 25% transparent. I could play with it some more. I could make, let's say I want to make the top part transparent. This is going to make the brightest part of my image transparent here, okay? So this middle, the middle area is gonna be fully solid. And you know, if I wanted, I could do other stuff in the middle. You know, I could, maybe I could make the middle semi-transparent and the, the edges fully transparent. So on a basic level, that's kind of the idea here. So I chose a gradient just because I think it's easier to see like where the blacks and whites are. So you can see, okay, I remember in the gradient, the blacks are down here, I'm suppressing them, I'll put this linear. And that's, that's kind of what's happening. Now there's some other controls on this that are kind of convenient. I can click preview, and this just shows me what my mask actually is. So if I drag it around here, you can see I'm changing the mask. So if I want to show the top 25%, you can see the bottom part of the image is all black because this is the darker part. So I can unclick preview. I can also easily invert if I, the mask if I want to, so I can quickly switch it there. So, so yeah, I'll do that. So let me know if there's any, anything that's not clear so far. I think the main thing is just with these graphs, understanding left to right is the dark to brights. And that's why I kind of made this going up and down. I didn't want to make the gradient going left to right because I don't want to confuse you that left would be left in the image. There are some actually tools where left on the graph is left in the image and right is right in the image. Some of the scopes do that, but in general, these tools is more just like left is the dark part. 
So this gradient, you know, it's kind of boring. Let's look at a more interesting example here. So here's an example where the uh, values obviously are way more mixed up. It's not just like this even gradient. So let's look at how this works. So once again, I'll right click on my mask layer. And I'll go to luminosity range mask. So I'll click on this. So now let's do what we did before. I can drag, I'll make the dark part uh, totally down, down to the bottom. I'll click linear again. And I made, the, I made the bottom layer green this time, of course. So now you can see the darkest parts of our image are fully transparent here. So if I toggle off, these are the darkest parts. The dolphin is the darkest part. You know, this part in the waves is pretty dark. And if I wanted, I could try to isolate the dolphin better, actually. I could go like that. And later on, I'll show you how to clean this up some more. But you can, you can actually manually uh, edit this after to get more uh, precision here. So there's also some other presets here. So for example, you can do shadows. This would be the shadows. Let me change this to blue just so it's a little less painful to look at. It's hurting my eyes. <laughs> okay, it's a little bit better than that green. So, you know, these are the presets here. So shadows, you can see basically it's just keep the blacks in and gradually fade out and suppress everything above, you know, mid-tone. We can, we can do mid-tones. That's another preset here. So it's just keeping that middle part in. So if I do preview, that's what's showing. And then we can do highlights. So you can actually uh, use these presets. You can also create your own preset. So if I create something I really like, I don't know, let's say I'm randomly, I like this for some reason, I can say create preset. If I can spell my name, Trent preset. And if I'm doing something else, I can go back and I can use the preset here. So it's just a little convenient thing there. So this is basically the main concept of the luminosity masks. So a lot of times what they're used for, oh, and by the way, something I forgot to mention, you can also like blur the radius. So um, actually, I want to do that. I want to do this. So if you zoom in here, whoops, you can have a little bit of a blur effect going. So that will soften the edges of your mask. So that'll make it a little, a little softer on the edges. Kind of up to you. So one of the main uses of this is for landscapes. So a common use case is that you have landscapes where you want to isolate the sky or you want to isolate the ground. And in this, in this example, I have a this is a color image, of course, but the concept is still the same. You know, a color has a value level and it's going to evaluate based on that. So a lot of times what we want to do is perhaps we want to make some change just to the ground or we want to make some change just to the sky. So we can create a mask to separate those. So let me do that. I'll right click here. I'll say luminosity range mask. And I think in this one, even if I do like highlights, I think it's a pretty good fit, like right at the beginning. I can kind of clean it up a little bit. You can see that's basically there. I have the, the sky. Hi, Grizzly Hands. Thanks for joining. I have the sky, and then the bottom is, is transparent. So I'll just, I'll just keep that. Now, the really cool thing is that you can take luminosity masks and apply them to adjustment layers as well. So this is one of the most common things that people use them for is using them to modify adjustments. So to, or as a reminder, adjustments are down here. So let me create an adjustment for curves. Now, I won't go too much into like what this, the curves do. It's essentially levels of uh, dark and white. So again, we have a straight line. Again, left to right is going to be our blacks to our whites. Like I, I said before, that that's gonna be usually what these types of graphs show. And up and down is also going to be darks to whites. It's going to remap our inputs to our outputs. So when it's a straight line, it just means it's no change. But if I go and I change it drastically, you don't have to exactly know what this means. The, mo the important thing is just to like see that an effect is being had. And I'm making it very extreme so you can see it. So you can see we've gone pretty extreme on the ground and the sky here. Now what I can do is I can apply my luminosity range mask to that. So I can take this luminosity range mask and I can actually drag it to the curves adjustment. And if I turn it on, 
you will see it only affects the sky here. So if I change my curves, if I reset it, only the sky is actually being affected here. And that's because, where's a good place to put this? There. The luminosity range mask, if we look at it, let's see what it actually looks like. We're just affecting the sky here. So our curves adjustment is being controlled or is being masked by the luminosity range mask here. So anything, any change we make to our curves is just going to affect this white area up here. Maybe a few of these little dots down here, if you're able to see those. But the black is not going to, the black is going to completely block the curves adjustment. So let me go back to that. So again, I'm just doing it very extreme so you can see the result. It might not be the best result you want, but that's kind of like just showing it. And this might be a good case to use the blur filter a little bit. So if I zoom in, you can see there's a little bit of an edge here. So let's go to the luminosity mask. If we do blur radius, you can see the, the effect happening down there. Now, one thing you want to be careful about is that blurring the radius, sometimes you get this halo effect. So you got to kind of like, you know, go with a, with a soft hand here. You want to be somewhat careful about it. Again, I'm not doing a sophisticated touch-up job right now, but it's just more of the concept. So this is something to consider, the, ra the radius, when you want to kind of soften those edges. Now, like I said before, you can actually clean up your luminosity mask. So if I alt-click on it, maybe we don't like, like this, this, this gray here. Maybe I want it to be pure white or pure black on the bottom. So actually, let me turn off the blur radius. So maybe I want to clean up this part down here. Well, you can actually paint on your luminosity range mask itself. So I can select black, use my brush. And then if you can see these dots down here, I can actually paint on them. And I can clean it up a little bit. So kind of like if, you, if you're familiar with adjustment layers also being a mask, the luminosity range mask is also, you can also kind of paint on the, the mask as, it, as itself. Or to make life easier, you can just create a separate mask for it also, which is sometimes what I like to do because I find it a little more flexible. So that's essentially a crash course in luminosity range masks. One thing that you may wonder is, as I said earlier, it's a related concept is the blend options. So if you clicked this gear here for the blend options, you may have seen this before. And really this left side of the blend options is pretty much a luminosity mask. So if I drag this down here, pull this up, down, you see it's essentially the same. There's a couple differences in the interface. Uh, let me open up a file here. I made this little, little uh, visual demonstration. So the luminosity range mask has a couple options that the blend options don't. So first of all, you can do presets. I, I also like the, the preview and invert output. Those things are not available in the, in the blend options. And the blur radius isn't really available in the blend options either. One of the things that blend options do give you is the you can change the channels if you like. So you can do red, green, and blue. And also you have this other control over here, which allows you to blend based on the layer below it. And that's kind of a more, I have a video on that and I, I talked about that in some other ones. So I won't, you know, make it, I won't muddy the waters by going into that. But this is a slightly different way of looking at it here. So the luminosity range mask and the blend options, they're fairly similar. I think one thing I like about the luminosity range mask is that, you know, you actually, like right now, there's nothing that really tells you that a blend option is being applied, right? Like you just have to kind of know like, oh, I clicked this before and, and that's like that. Um, whereas if you actually add a luminosity range mask, I like that you can actually see it there. So that, that's, for me, that's a big advantage. So it's, it's a matter of taste. I think they're, they're fairly similar, but there's a few little differences there. In some cases, it may not matter which one you use. So in terms of our advanced masking concepts, that was the first one I wanted to go over today. Let's go back here. Let me know if you guys have any questions or anything in the chat there. The next one is quite similar. It's called a hue range mask. And as you can probably guess, we just made uh, masking based on hue. Uh, we just made masking based on luminosity. We can also do it based on hue. So let's look at some demos for that. Let me close some of these files here. And again, the reason you'd want to do this kind of stuff is because it's 
it depends on your image, but maybe your image is structured in such a way that it's easier to use these types of masking than it is to manually use a selection brush or something like that. So for the hue range mask, you access it the same way you did the other ones. So I want to keep this one on the bottom as kind of the reference so you can see what the image originally looked like. So we have these gradients, a rainbow gradient, of course. So I'll apply a hue range mask to the top, to the top gradient. So I have this layer here. And like before, I'll just right click on the mask layer and I'll choose hue range mask. Now it looks different than the, than the uh, luminosity range mask, but perhaps you've seen this before. If you've ever done like an HSL adjustment or something like that, you may have seen this color wheel. And I can drag these dots around. And what I'm doing, if I click preview, is I'm moving my mask around here. So let's unclick preview for a second. So what am I actually, what do these dots actually mean? Well, what these dots mean is what area am I, what area of the color spectrum am I allowing to appear through? So here you can see I have the middle of the, the middle, between the middle two dots here, you're going to let this color through 100%. Okay, so if I go preview, this is like that strong white part here, okay? So that's that strong white part here. And I can move it around here. Now I have this, this red here. The outer two dots, this is just gonna be your fade out. So again, if I go to preview, the outer two dots is just gonna be a slowly, gradually going to black, essentially. So you're kind of softening the edge. So if I go back to preview, I can tighten up these dots here if I wanna make it more solid. Of course, I can also move these dots out so I can have a wider range if I like. And kind of a more advanced concept, you know, depending on what you want to do, these slopes here, you may wonder like, what are these? Well, these are going to determine like how sharp these outer dots, the, the fall off is for them. So if I pull these outer dots in, you can see it's still kind of a little fuzzy there. But if I actually adjust these fall offs here, I guess I'd want to do that. Yeah, I can make a very solid drop off like that. And I can go around. Now in a photograph, you probably wouldn't want to do this because you kind of want that softness in things to kind of give it a little more gradual transition, but uh, it may be useful in certain graphic situations. So Oliver, reading your comments. <laughs> yeah, so you're saying to your shame, you never use luminosity masks. You probably work too much in designer. Yeah, it, it really is gonna depend on like what type of work you do. If you're doing a lot of vector stuff with solid colors and that kind of thing, you might not might not use it that much. If you're doing more photography based work, you, you may be using it more. Um, I find in designer, I have used the blend options a little bit when I want to like get rid of like the white part of an image or something, or maybe I want to like have the background removed a little bit, but certainly when it's like more of a vector based stuff, luminosity doesn't really play as much a role in it. It's usually more when you have raster graphics that you're playing around with. So yeah, so this is the, the hue range mask. And I'm just kind of, this is basically how it works. You have your, I guess you don't have pre, you can create presets, but it doesn't give you any predefined ones. Of course, the, the import, oh, another cool thing is the picker option here. So if I click the picker and I click somewhere here, it's actually not gray. It's, it's what would be there if it wasn't selected there. So if I click picker over here, it's going to be blue in this area if I click. So it centers around my blue there. And these dots are really just, again, about how tight you want this selection to be. And we can see that here. So the inner dots are going to be solid white. The outer dots are going to fade off. So that's a basic overview of the tool. Let's look at a, an actual more interesting file here. Yeah, so this is an example of, like, what if we wanted to actually work with an image and select a certain color? So for example, in this case, maybe we wanted to change the colors of the, the wheels here. So, well, that's a perfect example of a, a hue range mask. We could also do like an HSL adjustment. Uh, you find with this stuff, there's always more than one way to do it. But let's go for a uh, hue, uh, hue range mask. And I could do the picker. And I could click here. And I have a pretty good selection of that yellow. I could tighten it up a little bit. And this is gonna be another good example of like later on, we can clean up the mask a little bit. So another thing I forgot to mention is that when you do the hue range mask, 
it actually kind of shows the color over here in your layer stack. So that's kind of cool. Like if I have green selected, it'll be green there. But I'll do yellow like that there. Now, you know, so far, what use is this? Well, like we saw last time, the main use is going to be applying it to some type of adjustment layer. So let's say I had a, an HSL adjustment. Um, let's do this. And maybe I, if I rotate my whole image here, maybe I will make the, the tires red. So here I have the tires red, right? Well, the problem is the whole image is being changed. So if I actually take my hue range mask and apply it to my HSL adjustment, of course, if I turn it on, I've isolated it much more to this range here. Now I'm getting a little bit of red and I'm getting a little bit of extra stuff in there too. Maybe I can clean it up a bit. So it seems like I've cleaned it up a little bit there. So now I changed the color of my, my tires is mostly just the tires being changed there. Maybe I can even like get it to match this other side there. So it looks more similar. I can change the saturation, make it darker. Now I'm seeing some of the, uh, some stuff happening over here. That's because the mask isn't perfect again. So what we can do is we can actually clean that up like we did before. Take black and I can just clean up some of these parts out here. Whoops. If it's having too much of an effect on things, I think some of these buildings are also getting hit a little bit. So now for the most part, it seems isolated down there. So this is an example of how you would use that. Um, the hue HSL, adjustment also does have a way of targeting things but this is you know it's another way of doing it creating the the uh, hsl uh, the hue the hsl range mask again what i like about this one is i think it just has pretty good options showing you what your mask looks like uh you can invert the output same as the other one but it's a pretty handy feature i think so yeah a lot of the information is the same as the luminosity range masks now we're just working with color here so that's kind of a crash course in that one. Let me know if you guys have any questions or if you, even you, if you've used this feature before, if you think it would be helpful. So now let's go to the compound masks. So this one isn't about selecting something. It's a little different. And let's open up that file. So let me show you a problem that could occur and like why we'd want to care about compound masks here. So let's say I want to mask out each of these balls separately. So let's, let's do that. Let's say I want to have one for the, the baseball here. I'll call this baseball mask. Let's call it baseball. Let's turn this off. Unless I want to have one for the basketball. So I'll call this basketball. Turn that off and let's do one for the tennis ball here. I'm not really worried about the getting the world's greatest selection. I'm just trying to get something rough going. Okay. So we have tennis. Unselect that. So, okay. So if I want to view just the tennis ball, I click just the tennis ball. That's nice. If I want to click just the base basketball, I can view just the basketball. If I want to view just the baseball, I can click, I can view just the baseball. Now, what if I just want to view the, ba the all the, the balls themselves together, but I want the background? Well, you may think, okay, let's just turn on all the masks. So let's do that. So I'll turn on the baseball. Then I'll turn on the basketball. And you notice everything disappears. And of course, if I turn on the tennis, it's also not there. So if I just have the tennis ball turned on, it shows. But if I turn on the basketball, it disappears. And you may be wondering, like, why is that happening? And the reason that happens is because by default, when you have masks together, the black part is going to take precedence over the white part when you combine all these images together. So you can see I have my tennis ball here. That's what this mask look like, looks like. I have all this black part. When I go and I add the basketball mask in, whoops, the black of the tennis ball was all over here. So 
essentially what it's doing is this is giving priority to the black part of our masks when we add them all up together. So a question would be, wouldn't it be nice if there was a button here where we could say, give precedence to the white part of the mask instead of the black part. Like just like use the white part of all these masks instead of like subtracting all, all of them together. And that is exactly what a compound mask does. It lets us set what mode we want the mask to be added to other masks. So let me turn these off. So as we saw before, um, the compound mask, once again, we right click on our mask layer here. And I can say add a compound mask. And we get this kind of cool little, I don't know, vice type graphic here. Let me add the tennis one to it. I'll add that there. So I'll drag it in. And you can see my tennis one is underneath there. So I'll turn it on. Okay, so we have that. Let me drag the basketball one in. And I'll turn the basketball on. And now the basketball is showing. And I'll turn, drag the bas baseball in. And now the baseball is showing. So you can see before, when we had these outside of the compound mask, they were all, the, the, neg the negative part of the mask was getting precedence. Now when we have all these in, the result is actually this. We're getting the white part of our masks getting precedence. And the reason that's happening is because this little icon here, by default, what a compound mask does is the difference is different than when we normally use a mask. A compound mask is going to add the white parts all together. And you can consider the white part as being say one and the black part as being zero. So when you add zeros together, it just gives you zero as the output. But if any of your layers has white in that part, you're going to get white in the result. So you can uh, not do this if you want, you can you can actually change this to subtract. So I can make that baseball be subtracted out outside of it if I wanted to, but I'll keep it to add right now. One thing you can do is you can mix and match things. So let me, let me show this here. So we have the, the three balls here. Maybe I wanted a layer where I just want to like cut a slice through these guys here. So let me add a, a, another mask here. Maybe I want this to, so let me explain what just happened. Let me delete this and explain what I just did. So I'm going to add a mask to this, right? So I'll add a mask. This mask is all white. So when I add an all white mask, it's going to show everything now, okay? So actually, if I want this mask that's being added to these to not show everything, I actually, I actually need to fill it with black. So let's do that. So this mask that's all black is being added to these other ones, but it's not actually doing anything. So now if I use my white paintbrush, I can actually paint, I can do something like this. I don't know if I wanted to. Let's just, let's just pretend this is some design I wanted to do. So you can see this, again, this white is being added to all the layers below it. So in the end, we're getting something like this. We have these three or four different masks now. Uh, Three of them were created by that selection, which manually created it. And then this last one up here, this was just me actually drawing on it. So that's a possibility. But I could, I could actually make this subtract. So now if I look at things, now you can see it's subtracting. So it's, it's kind of funny actually to think about this because I painted on my mask with white, but the white part is actually subtracting from what's below it, okay? So if you show my mask, when you're subtracting, when you have the mask set to subtract mode, the white is going to be removed from the, the results below it. And I should say that you should think of these things as being built from like the bottom layer up. So that's kind of, that's how it's working there. So this, like I said, this is actually quite a useful concept if, again, you're working with photos and that default situation I showed you before, when the layers are all outside of the outside of the image like this, let's put them there. Uh, I'll delete that. Um, actually, I want them there. You're gonna have a problem. So like you can't actually individually add these things together because it's gonna be the, the negative space, the black taking precedence. So in this case, we would add a compound mask and then we can easily put these things in there. 
So that's how you go about that. So that's those are some of the advanced masking concepts I want to go over today. We're going to go over talking about it for about 30 minutes. So hopefully it gave you some uh, interesting insights into how these things work. As I said, you can right click on the mask layer here. And yeah, I think compound mask is a super useful one if you want to isolate things and um, decide whether or not they're going to be, say, added together or subtracted. If you want to get away from that default behavior of how masks work. And then the luminosity range masks, good for removing certain value ranges. And hue range mask, good for removing certain color ranges. But again, this is more for the photo side of things. So it'll depend on kind of your use case. So let me know if you guys had any questions on that. I can certainly go over them. I'll be going over your other questions now. But like in the chat, if you have any questions about masks and stuff, we can go over that too. So I'll give you some time to ask. Let's go through here, the Q&A. So the last couple of videos I released were on brushes. And I think it's kind of a useful concept because if you can like leverage Photoshop or Procreate brushes, it's, it's kind of a cool thing, you know? Um, Affinity does have lots of, there's lots of brushes online for that, but if you can also bring in Procreate brushes, it's kind of cool. Um, Oliver says, amazing, we'll try that tomorrow. Yeah, definitely give it a try. A lot of this stuff, you kind of just have to play with it a little bit. And once you go through a couple examples yourself, you kind of see how it works. With this masking stuff, I always like to like just look at a black and white gradient and ask myself like what's happening here? You know, what is this luminosity thing doing? With the with the hue range mask, you know, get a color gradient, download some rainbow and just see what happens when you play around with it. Maybe try isolating the colors in some photos and see what happens. And then the compound mask, it's kind of a more niche use case, but definitely as you get complicated projects with multiple masks going you're going to have to modify how they work together because every time you add a new mask, it's going to subtract from the other ones. So you need to, you know, create a compound mask to get them, you know, interacting the way you want. So the question I got about one of the pro one of the, these, these, um, these, uh, videos was, can any PNG be made to a brush? As far as I know. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've had good luck with it so far. And, um, like I said, there's a difference between the intensity brush and the image brush. So an intensity brush is going to give you some some uh, level of color that you can choose versus an image brush. And he said, I also got asked, can this be done with any brushes in terms of any Procreate brushes? So with Procreate, as I showed in the video, like you can actually extract that PNG file and you can do whatever you want with it. So for the most part, yeah, like to the degree that you can get any of the PNGs, you can do something with it. The big question is like, can you do this with any Photoshop brush? Like some Photoshop brushes, you import them and they, they work. Some, they kind of have some issues with them. It depends on what type of advanced features they use. So uh, for the most part, I'd say give it a try and, and see what happens. With Procreate, you can usually export the PNG and build your own brush from it. Photoshop, I don't know exactly what the brush format is, but uh, if you go to here, it lets you, if you click import brush, Usually Affinity just works with it, but sometimes there's advanced features you can't do. So yeah, second minute reading your comment. So you're saying you saw this with Compound Mask and didn't really understand it. Now you understand it. Great, yeah. Happy to hear that. Like I said, it's just kind of that, that idea of as you add masks to the, your top layer stack, they're just going to gradually all subtract from each other so you can use Compound Masks to change the mode of them. And Bill says you enjoys my tutorials. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, got another question here. So I, I have a video for the basics of using masks in Affinity Photo. And someone said, can masks be used in Affinity Designer? Yes, you can. It's a little bit different though. I have, I have a video like right next to this one for Affinity Designer masking. The main thing at Affinity Designer is that you're going to want to uh, the raster masks are in the pixel persona. So if I do this, so if I create some image here, so this is a vector. Now you can do some stuff with masking here, but the, to get the, the, the raster masking effect, you're gonna to wanna to go to pixel persona in Affinity Designer. And then if you click mask layer, then you can go and what should I do? I'll select the, the pixel, the paintbrush tool, which isn't available in the designer persona. So I'll select this brush. And let's choose kind of a cooler brush. Let's choose something that's like some type of acrylic. Give a little bit of texture. 
So I can actually mask out my vector here. So this is still a vector actually. I mean, this, this circle is a vector, but the mask is a raster that's being applied over it. So I can, I can hide it and it's still there. You can't do this over here because you don't have that paintbrush here. There's a mask feature, but it's a little bit different. Um, so yes, to answer your question, you can use masks in Affinity Designer. If you want to use the raster option, you probably, you're going to have to go to the Pixel Persona. And I kind of explain more of that in the, the video for the Affinity Designer one. So hope that's useful. So one question I got was about the warping and the perspective. And again, it's kind of that difference between Affinity Photo and Affinity Designer. Sometimes it's a little bit frustrating. Um, you can you can do image warping in Affinity Photo, but in, not in Affinity Designer. So let's look at a little bit of that difference here. Julie says now she understands why she couldn't get masks to work in Designer. Yeah, it's uh the pixel persona is how you would do it there. So that's, that's the, the trick. So this question is about warping things. So let me find just a, a random image somewhere. Um, this one was in my history. Let's do this. So I'm in Affinity Designer right now. And let's look at a couple things. Let's say I build a vector house. Again, some awesome art here. Um, where's my shapes? Let's do this. I know, let's make a little blue house. A little red. All right, we'll group it. So this is my vector house. And I can actually distort a vector with the warp group here. So I can, I'm gonna click this warp group down here. So this again, Fane Designer, designer persona, I'm going to click the warp group, and I can say perspective. And it ver behaves pretty awesomely, I can change stuff in perspective here. And there's, there's different met there's different warp groups here, but this is a vector shape I'm warping here. So you may think, okay, let's do that the same thing with an image, I'll click the image here. And let's do that perspective warp perspective, and then you do it and you get stuff like this. And it's actually not doing what you expected. It's actually not working. Um, I mean, it's doing what Affinity Designer says it's going to do, but it's not what we want it to do. So you can see that if you use an image here in Affinity Designer, this is what happens. Whereas if you go to Affinity Photo, um, in Affinity Photo, if you use the live filter and then you go to perspective, where is it here? It actually behaves as we want it to. So that's kind of a difference. If you want to actually, I don't know why this isn't available in Affinity Designer, it should be. But if you want to like start warping things, whoops, like this, you need to do it in, um, you need to do it in Affinity Photo. So Affinity, Fo Affinity Photo allows you to change images like this. Affinity Designer, you can see it's not actually changing the image. It's just like cropping it in different ways. But you know, for vectors and stuff, the affinity designer thing is actually very nice. Um, it also works with text. So uh, my text. So you can do a warp group on that perspective, change it like that. You can do all sorts of cool stuff. Just doesn't work on photos for some reason. I, I don't know why, but that was, a decision that someone made. So Saif, I'm reading your comments. So you said you bought version 2.4. Will it be a change after KNFA's acquisition, uh, Canva's acquisition? Um, yeah, so far we just don't know. They released a statement, Affinity did the next day, saying that they're going to continue adding new features and the 2.5 update is on the way. So they're going to be releasing that. Uh, it's just mostly speculation at this point. We really don't know how their future will change. So what they've told us is no, no changes are planned. They're committing to not, they're committing to at least always offering some option for a one-time payment plan. But you know, I, I've, that comment I've seen a lot of skepticism on people not believing it or saying companies have been acquired in the past, you know, um, could happen. We just don't know at the moment. So we shall see. 
So I made a video on the paint mixer brush. <clears throat> and again, this is an Affinity Photo feature. Let me show you how that works. So the paint mixer brush, it's a type of paintbrush. And I think I can close this now. Let me just create a new file here. So let me create a pixel layer. So if I create the normal paintbrush here, let me, um, I'll put on some red. And if I put on some blue, that happens. Now, on the other hand, if I use the paint mixer brush, let's do that. And let me do the same thing. So I'll put some blue there. Again, I'm using a mouse, so it's very, um, now what happens if I put in the, the red? So let me, let me use a different brush. This, this brush isn't that great. Let me use like the acrylic brush. Yeah, so I'll do this. So I'll paint in some red. Now if I paint in some blue, you actually start to get like a mixing effect. It's actually not working too well with this one. I think this one, yeah. So you can see I'm getting this purple now. Let's try another one. So this is with the, the paint mixer brush. I'm, I'm putting down pure uh, blue. Let me switch to red. Now if I do red, I can get like a, a mixing effect going on there, okay? And I, I released a video about how this works. So the mixer brush will mix paint together. So you can actually get things going, like you know, combining reds and blues and, and things like that and get interesting effects. Is this an Affinity Designer? It is not an Affinity Designer. Um, it's just an Affinity Photo. The closest you can get in Affinity Designer is you can smudge things in the Pixel Persona. So if I'm on the Pixel Persona here, this is Affinity Designer. If I do something like this, I can put down some paint. And if I put down some blue, it's not going to actually interact. Um, there's a bit of smudging here, but I don't think, I don't know if it's actually really mixing the colors as well. It doesn't really blend the colors that way. It's kind of a hack. If you have both programs, I would definitely recommend using it in Affinity Photo. So that's, you can kind of do that, but it's not as nice as um, this here in Affinity Photo, which is more, more sophisticated paintbrush options. So short answer, not really. You can't really do it. You can't do it in Affinity Designer. So Oliver, your hope is that Serif with the power of Canva now has the power to integrate AI. Yeah, I think there's definitely lots of AI features that would be welcome. Um, vector tracing is a big one. I think the future of that feature is really the future of that feature. But like going forward, when you see AI vector tracers, it's so much better than just algorithmic or programmatic vector tracers. I think there does need to be some type of AI component to get that to work. I released a video on that a few months ago. It's already out, outdated because like one of the tools that I said was free is now paid and you know, things are getting updated all the time. But yeah, I would love to see vector tracing an AI based version. I would love to see something like the con smart content expansion. So like when you, if you have a landscape and you just expand the sky, it automatically fills that in and stuff like that. That'd be pretty cool. So yeah, we'll see. I think AI is going to be unavoidable going forward. So I got this question about the artboards and yes, one thing that happens is Affinity has this concept of the like sub pixel sizing and sub pixel movement. So let me show you something here. Um, if I create an artboard, actually I should create that. Let me create this document pixels. It's easier to see um, pixels. So I have this enabled whole pixels and force pixel alignment enabled by default. And I can turn it off. One of the things that can happen is that if you have that turned off, if you notice here, you can actually get fractional pix pixel values here. Okay. And it's kind of, it can be kind of annoying to fix once you, once your document gets in that state. Now, if I create this, if I, let's say I make this 1000, by 1000. Okay. I can go to the export persona. 
and it says 1,000 by 1,000. But there's kind of a strange, there's kind of strange bugs where if you create another document here, if I go back to the export persona, it still says 1,000 by 1,000. But sometimes if you move things around, they don't say that anymore. Let me think how it kind of, and I'll show you guys a, a post that I contributed to on the affinity forums about that. Let's see if I do this. I resize. Yeah, I can't replicate it right now, but there's definitely like edge cases where if your document is a certain size, like he has at 1000, 1185 by 54, you can get these off by one errors in the export persona where you, where it's actually like one pixel is added to the sizes of your image there. I'm trying to remember like how to recreate it, but let's see what this says. 770. Let's make this 1000 again. There's some common situation where like if you resize one thing and move something else, uh, it'll, it'll be there. So Julie, are you referring to the export persona? Yeah, it's, um, I'm not, again, it's like, sometimes I can reproduce it, sometimes I can't, it's kind of frustrating. So it's uh, kind of a Heisenberg as we call it. Um, so there was a post that I, in the affinity forums, And it's kind of a known issue. So if any designer added one pixel in slice export and like it was first posted, I don't know, when was this posted? Maybe over a year ago or so. And if you kind of like go down, like lots of people, are, lots of people have talked about it. I don't know what the current status of it is. I, I posted a, like my comment there. So yeah, what do I do? I rearrange them. Yeah, so I can't, like, it's not reproducing for me right now, but in the past I've had that problem. And, you know, I think it's because Affinity tries to have this concept of, like, sub-pixel spacing. And I really, I'm not a fan of that kind of thing. I wish, I wish it was just, like, whole pixels, you know. But apparently for rendering, they have this concept of sub-pixel um, measurement. And, like I said, there's a, um, where's my forum post? or it's not my forum post, but it's one that was there. Yeah, you can read about things here. If you, if you Google it, if you Google the uh, one pixel error, people talk about it there. So the short answer is, you know, it comes to enabling this stuff when you create your document. If you've already created a document and then you go and enable this, I've had problems with it still being off by one. So that that's kind of a thing. So it's definitely something to keep an eye out when you export your image really double check to make sure these artboards are the the size you expect and they're not off by one. You know, for me, this, this is a, an issue because I'll do like seamless patterns and this will add like a one pixel hairline on one side or something. So it's like super frustrating, but yeah, hopefully it's something that will be uh, remedied more in the future. So yes. So that was the last question I, I had there. I'll give you guys a couple more minutes if you want to um, ask anything in the, the time remaining. Oliver, reading your comments. So you're saying you never you never notice this bug, but you rarely use the export persona anyway. Most of the time, you just export as printable PDF. Yeah, it kind of depends. Um, most of the time, I don't use the export persona either because I'm just exporting to like one file and I just know what I'm doing. It's, a, it's always just like a, a PNG of my document or a JPEG of my document. But some people, they use it a lot because they have different artboards and they want one thing to be like a vector and one thing to be a PNG and you know, one thing to be 2x size for the web or something like that. So yeah, different people, it's useful for some people. I, I use it sometimes, but not a lot. But in terms of videos, uh, I'm planning, I going to do, I'm going to do one on edge detection and which kind of leads into the, the uh, band pass mask. So <laughs> If you're into masks, we have an. I'll be planning another one on the bandpass mask. And this is gonna be related to like the frequency separation and like low pass and high pass band filters, which I think has some technical language, but I think it's actually a pretty simple concept, and I want to explain it to people because I think um, 
it'll help them understand. This will be more of like the photography based thing, but they're just kind of lots of words that seem complicated. But when you when you know what they mean, they're not they're not that complicated. So hopefully you can can um hopefully I'll be out soon. What do you actually use to work as a standard graphics tablet? So mostly right now, I'm, I just mostly use a mouse and keyboard for my desktop setup. In the past, I've used a Huey on, Huey on um, Canva for a tablet. Now I had like a screen on it, which I could use. Um, let me see what that is. Huey on Canva. Um, I'm just trying to find it. Yeah. I've liked them in the past, but I haven't used it recently. Once I got an iPad, I mostly just started using that. But my, my it was something like this in the past that I liked. Um, Huey on, I bought it about four years or so ago. I still have it somewhere. Um, but yeah, that was what I've used in the past. And nowadays I mostly use uh, the iPad. Hi Teak, glad you made it, thanks for coming. Do I plan on making a few tutorials for the iPad? Julie is asking. Uh, I would like to. The main thing is I just need to figure out how to like film it. Essentially, I'm kind of I have my desktop set up here, and I just need to like look into how I can actually get a camera to record it. Maybe I can ask Teak for some tips because he uh, he does a lot of um, iPad videos. Like he has a really good setup for recording um, iPad stuff. So I just need to figure out how to actually get a setup going. It's always tricky when you're like, comfortable with one thing that's like okay let's get another technical setup going i also want to do more videos away from the, the desk but i did a little bit experimentation i wasn't happy with the sound so that, that was the main thing that was the main reason why so yeah i get a lot of requests for the ipad um stuff so i definitely see that there's demand there so i'm going to try to it's on my list a lot of things are on my list <laughs> all right i'll give you guys like another minute or so But I do have a long list of things to um, affinity also, but I want to do some more stuff on like some, I guess, some mid journey thing, some printified things coming up. Screen record. So slice keeper saying screen record captures built into iPad. Yeah, that could, that could be, um, I'm off to check that out too. Hi Dwight. I'm just getting ready to sign off, but thanks for joining now. So Oliver saying, do I use the iPad as a second monitor? I don't, I just use, <clears throat> Down here, I have two physical monitors set up, mounted. Um, upstairs on my, my normal work computer, I just have one monitor attached to my laptop, but I don't really use the laptop screen at all. So yeah. But yeah, so I think uh, I'll wrap it up for today. Thanks all you guys for joining. Um, thanks Teak for joining again. Great to see you here and Dwight and Oliver and Julie Slicekeeper. Um, all of you guys, thanks for joining so much. And um, I'll plan to be out again on next week. So if you have any questions or about anything related to Affinity or, again, print on demand is something I also do, uh, Canva, things like that, feel free to ask, like, on, the, on any of my videos. Like, if you, you can ask any on there. Uh, there's also contact information on my, on my YouTube page. If you go to the About section, you can, uh, you can eventually find my email address. It's a little bit hidden. But thanks, guys, and I will see you next time. Thanks for joining me, and see you next time.